So hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today uh, for our lecture series, uh, the ASU Council for Aramic and Islamic Studies. And uh, with our distinguished guest speaker, Professor Rokhaya Mustafa Abasharaf. And uh, at first, I'd like to give you a, a brief just uh, background about the Council for Arabic and Islamic Studies that um, was established at Arizona State University to acknowledge the significant contributions of Arabic studies and Islamic studies and Islamic civilization and cultures to the world at large, both historically and in the modern age. The Council's research and teaching programs seek to promote multiculturalism, diversity, interfaith dialogue, cross-cultural understanding, and the expansion of human civilization and cultures through Arabic, as well as other Middle Eastern languages, um, such as Turkish and, and uh, Persian. The Council seeks to develop constructive academic and cultural interaction and partnerships between ASU and similar groups of the Arab and Islamic worlds. And uh, my name is Dr. Suad Ali. I am the founding chair of the Council for Arabic and Islamic Studies. I am professor of Middle Eastern Studies in the School of International Letters and Cultures in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Our distinguished uh, uh, speaker today is Professor Rukhaya Mustafa Abu Sharaf. Uh, she is a professor of anthropology uh, at Georgetown University, and now she is on the campus of Qatar in Doha. She is the author of numerous books, including the most recent book, uh, Darfur um, Allegory, Transforming Displaced Women, University of Chicago Press, that came in 2000, uh, 2021. And um, uh, she, she has a vast you know, scholarship and research and in anthropology, ethnographic writing, humanistic and anthropology and feminist anthropology. In addition, in addition to her ethnographic work in the Sudan and the US, her current uh, research uh, is in Oman and Zanzibar and continues to explore um, uh, memory and identity among Swahili speaking and uh, Zanzibari of Omani descent. Um, today, her distinguished lecture is focusing on burning desires, Zanzibari women in the throes of concubinage and forced marriages. At this point, I'd like to give her the floor and Professor Abu Sharaf, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to the lecture series of the Council for Arabic Islamic Studies. Uh, what a terrific honor, Professor Ali. Thank you so much for giving me this fantastic opportunity to, uh, to talk to you uh, and to share some uh, thoughts on this ethno new ethnographic project. It is wonderful uh, to be with you as always. And thank, I would like to thank everybody in the audience. And I ask uh, for your forgiveness and overbearance <laughs> in advance as I, uh, read uh, my uh, the paper that I uh, prepared for this lecture. Sure, we look forward to that. All right, uh, I, I will start this by uh, a subheading that I called Holy Ordinances. A Ugandan man named John Okello claimed to have had a dream in which Jesus implored him to rise against Arab rule in the Zanzibar archipelago. Inspired by the words of James chapter four and five, he recited the holy utterances to himself. Quote, be patient brethren until the coming of the Lord. Behold the, hu the husbandsman waits for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he receives the early and latter rain. Be you also patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord of the Sabbath is near." Unquote. This zealous Christian and self-identified field mar marshal rose up to act in accordance with the divine instruction. 
In the critical year of 1964, he besieged. For the cause of freedom, gentlemen, I have no alternative but to ask you to act and to act now. I ask you to join your men with mine in a powerful team capable of defeating the Arabs. If you are able to do this, I shall delay no longer, but commence immediately to overthrow by force this most vicious colonialist government. I have no doubt that we shall win and that the sufferings of the African shall come to an end. This is the end of the quote. Wielding machetes, automatic rifles, and handguns, the aroused segments of the population obeyed by attacking the ruling Arab elite in Unguja. The attack lasted for nine hours and destroyed the centuries old Omani empire. The pogroms that followed convulsed the communities of Omani descent and displacement, dispossession, and death at the hands of the revolutionaries ensued. The last Sultan Jamsh Sayyid Saeed bin Harib al Busaidi, his family, and others with means immediately fled the island. A revolutionary government was established, and Zanzibar was soon annexed to Tanganyika to form the present day Republic of Tanzania. While many Zanzibari Omanis remember the revolution as genocide and invasion, its sympathizers laud it as an act that freed the Africans from the yoke of Omani dominance. In this episode, the experience of Zanzibari women of Arab and Asian extraction was that of civilians in war. They were subjected to sexual violence of biblical proportions, including rape and to what later came to be known as the Nudua Zakarumi or Karumi's forced marriage after President Karumi. Despite the egregiousness of forced marriage, Nadua Zakarumi was met with becoming enthusiasm as an attempt to erase racial disparities through interracial sex and literal fertilization. Furthermore, some commentators agreed that as the fairest African president of Zanzibar, uh, Ibed Amani Karumi, who ruled from 1964 until his assassination in 1972, acted out of karmic justice for African women who had been subject, subjected to concubinage under Omani rule. My objective in this presentation is to situate, to situate human actors at the forefront of the discussion of concubinage, which in Zanzibar no, known as Sarari, uh, singular surria, and forced marriage. I see both practices as laboratories in which the complexities of sex and power were in full display. Throughout, I draw an inspiration from anthropologist Tim Ingold's theory of correspondence. He writes, Every living being should be envisaged, not as a blob, but as a bundle of lines. What I show that in joining with one another, these lines comp comprise a meshwork in which every node is a knot. And in, the, in answering to one another, lifelines correspond, end of quote. This presentation also draws valuable insights from the intersection of black feminist thought and humanistic anthropology to deepen our understanding of both concubinage and forced marriage as forms of se sexual bondage occurring within particular political circumstances and historical realities. For indeed, both objectifying practices assume the variety of meanings in colonial and, in colonial and post-revolutionary Zanzibar. While co when conjugating Sarari and Nadua Zakarumi, the complex within the complex grammar of race, class, and gender, 
we also often encounter inconsistencies inherent in fraught human relationships and further by the marked fluidities and the slippage, slippages of both practices and their varying connotative, pragmatic, and ideational significances. Thus, I ask, was the Nudua Zakarumi an act of retribution against concubinage, which I address in the fairest part of this presentation, or was it a contribution to a nation building project in a society adrift, which I discuss in the second part of the presentation? To consider these questions, I draw on a variety of ethnographic insights I have gathered in Zanzibar and Oman between 2016 and 2020, and the constellation of texts, including archives, local historiographies, a collection of Swahili statements for and against Nadua, uh, possessed by an interlocutor, memoirs, and other e-field notes gathered in 2021 under corona conditions. My commentaries focus on what anthropologist N. Seng Ho calls oceanic intimates as I explore what was at stake in these two parallel modes of exploiting women's bodies. I argue that they cannot be understood in isolation from their correspondences and the emotionality manifested in both gendered social dramas. Let me say a little bit about Omanis in Zanzibar. I call this an archipelagic Marlibrium circularity. Lush historical materials and travelogues tell a fascinating migratory story. A single man sailed from Muscat in Oman, a place long recognized as exceptionally cosmopolitan to Eastern Africa. Because their point of origin, Muscat, brimmed with historical importance, linguists were attracted to deciphering the etymology of Muscat itself. Many found in the term evidence of this, these separate provenances and infusions of languages and ethnicities, corroborating the city's wide contacts beyond its frontiers. Arabic sources posit that Muscat could be closely related to the past tense sakat, which men fell, describing a place that appears to have fallen amidst the gigantic mountains and hills that surround it. Muscat was also associated with the term Muscat Arras, meaning anchorage, the resting place of the head. Others saw a connection between Muscat and the city in uh, Iraq. Muscat al-Ramli. This comports with Potlemy's map of Arabia, wherein he designates it as a cryptus portus, a hidden port. These linguistic clues point to the geographic fact that Muscat is a literal society lying along the Indian Ocean, linking diverse peoples and cultures since times immemorial. Living in this vast trim, nurtured a desire for traversing the sea in a circular route powered by the ocean's annual monsoons, a desire supported by Romani shipbuilding and mastery of navigating by the stars. The to towing and throwing of these migrations were critical for the Swahilization of the Arabic speaking Omanis as they sailed to Eastern Africa and to Zanzibar, an island no less cosmopolitan than Muscat encompassing populations of African, Arab, Comorians, Indian, and the small communities of Europeans, Goans, Somali, and Chinese. As for the African majority, Abdelaziz uh, Lozi illuminates the heterogeneity. Indigenous Africans were divided into Wahadimu, Wanguja, Wapemba, wa Tumbato. The Wahadimu were domiciled in the southern and central parts of Unguja, which is the main seat of the Omani uh, rule, essentially rural, rural, 
uh, they were urbanized more than others, uh, other uh, Shirazi groups. And we can talk about this later if there is interest. Uh, the Watombato were spread from the Isle of Tombato to Northern Unguja and so on. Uh, indeed, as Ned Alpers explains, movements of people both from continental or mainland littorals in the first millennia of the current era from Africa, Arabia, and the Gulf, and even South Asia, uh, end of quote, have much to teach us about the correspondences that formed human relations in Zanzibar as they had among the islands of the Indian Ocean. Over the next years and decades, the diaspora of Oman's al Busaidi elites relocated their capital from Muscat to Zanzibar to create one of the most powerful maritime empires on the Indian Ocean. What developed over the centuries was a boom and bust of imperial presence based on a plantation economy powered by the enslavement of African Zanzibaris. The result was an empire and quote, I quote here, the result was an empire locked in a tight embrace of intimacy, treachery, a relationship of mutual benefits, attraction, and aversion. End of quote. Here I cite in Senko. In both contexts of earlier Omani migrations to transferring of their capital to Zanzibar, we encounter places that were li linked temporarily and especially and remained ever so powerful by the monsoon. Before considering this embrace of intimacy and treachery, I must note that some delimits to my discussion. First, I focus on concubines or surreas who bore their master's children and in turn amalgamated themselves into existing family and power networks. I am aware that those who did not become pregnant did not have the same opportunity and vanished into oblivion. Second, in my consideration of Nadua Zakarumi, I have not encountered any woman who consented to marrying her fourth husband, except in an idiosyncratic interview conducted by Aisha al Bulali with Fatma al Burwani, also known as Fatma Jin. Jinja, who agreed to marry Yusuf Hamid, who was a member of the military council. Uh, she justified this by saying, oh, because of the direst economic straits uh, I encountered, I found myself into after the revolution, I had to marry Yusuf Hamid. Then it stands to reason that there were others whose economic situation and other contingencies influence their consent to a marriage they would not have otherwise entered to, into. But I do not have materials to present at the moment uh, to present um, or to mount uh, a substantive argument about this. Finally, it is necessary to bear in mind the heterogeneity of Arab and African communities and their multiple transactions over the centuries especially when we encounter the essentialized narrative of the 1964 revolution as an African response to Omani colonization. The complexity of Zanzibar social formations was best captured by an interlocutor who stated to me in interview in Zanzibar, quote, neither all Africans were murderers and nor all Omanis dropped anchor in Zanzibar as colonizers, end of quote. The African communities, for example, in Pemba Island, played no role in the pogroms, a position for which they were castigated in the month and years following the revolution. I turn now to co the question of concubines and concubinage. I call it meshwork in its pride. The inscrutable institution of concubinage embodies the knotted rules of engagement emblematic of the meshware conceptual scheme. Following Ingold, I aver 
that concubinage is not a blob. It would be more analogous to a knot from which lines fan out, tangling with the lines of all other, unquote. Inter, inter, entwined relationships, entitlements, obligations, and duties. Although concubine, concubinage was a fact of Zanzibari society, as with interpretations of the revolution, it is necessary to circumvent reductive post-positivist interpretations of a reality that is neither monolithic nor absolute. Concubinage exhibited the multidirectional reality characteristic of all human relationships. In the Zanzibari context, multiple realities coexisted and correspondence in a myriad of ways, making it, making it impossible to apprehend in isolation with lived, from lived experience. Although among Romanis, uh, concubinage was primarily an elite aristocratic practice, and as a byproduct product of slavery, non-slave holders, including Africans, Hindus, and Europeans, had also trafficked in the institution. Nonetheless, we don't know enough about Zanzibari involvement in concubinage to compare it to the practice in another context. For example, among the slave owners in the Antebellum South, as studied by Larry Koger, who had the advantage of extensive records, taxes, uh, receipts, uh, federal census, mortgage bills, and et cetera, to try to, to create that narrative about slave holding. We also lack published personal narratives about and by concubines chronicling their sexual experiences and intimacies. Instead, what we are left with is a slender body of formulaic and repetitive manumission testimonies issued by the British on the eve of emancipation on the island and elsewhere. Instead, I shall attempt to interlace analysis from Abdul Sharif uh, Sharif's Surya, concubine or secondary slave wife, Abdel Wahab Bouhdaiba's sexuality in Islam, with insights in Emily Ruta's memoirs of an Arabian princess, hence uh, we shall refer to it as memoirs. And finally, with Leslie Pierce's Imperial Harim. I also reflect on the agency tactics Emily Ruta suggested. Uh, in the way that concubines deployed to consider the notion that as humans, quote, we are not tailored for complete autonomy nor for total submission, unquote. This exercise of agency, however, should not obviate the lived realities of concubines surreas as women entrapped in a subservient condition. From this vantage, po vantage point, we can come to appreciate the dialectical, even if volatile ways in which submission and agency operated. Womb blinks, Silat al rahim Every Omani has an African Zanzibari relative. Our sense of identity as Omanis and Swahili is solid, an interlocutor uh, declared. Uh, Sharif's, Abdul Sharif's Surya, concubine or secondary slave wife, engages some of the conundrums of the institutions that have for centuries eluded those outside the Islamic world and whose representations do not comport with lived experiences. His understanding of the figure of the Surya as a secondary wife illuminated the fuzzy borderlines between marriage and concubinage consent and dissent, agency and submission. By no means an apologist for the institution, nor unconscious of the shilling transactions of the slave market, he nonetheless showed Surya to be a context and time bound practice rooted in compounding structures of power and kinship. The fact that the concubine Surya was eligible for the elevated status of queen mother palpably differentiated her, for example, from American slave women and their offspring, whose masters would often, are you here? Uh, 
would often enough subject their own children and their mothers to the action block along with animals. Abdul Sharif writes, a slave was not merely chattel, but also a human being with certain religious and legal rights and social status. Moreover, the, ob the offspring of such unions between owners and surreas were free children of their free fathers with full rights like those possessed by free mothers." And quote. Pierce makes an analogous point in her study of the Ottoman imperial harem uh, of the 16th and 17th centuries, arguing that within the Ottoman empire here was a continuity from ordinary household to, dynasty, to the dynasty in the structure of poli the politics of the family. Significantly, both Sharif and Pierce examine concubinage embeddedness in reproductive politics apart from its sensuality and iconicity. Again, in this contrast uh, to the Atlantic context, Roger Sanjik describes offspring of any white black pairings and marriages were considered black. They did not inherit the ethnicity of their white parent in a socially recognized manner. And they were incorporated, uh, were not incorporated into their white parents' kinship networks. So then why was a Surya considered a secondary wife and not a sexual slave? Anthropological insights on marriage in this regard is helpful since the subject has been a preoccupation from the times of the earliest ethnography, muddying an already complex topic with a variety of fantasies and the stereotypes, wrote uh, Murdoch 80 years ago. What would anthropologists such as George Murdoch and Edmund Leach say about the term secondary wife if they were to comment her? Surya. 83 years ago, Murdoch argued that marriage exists only when the economic and the sexual are unified into one relationship. And Edmund Leach recognized the rights conferred by the institution of marriage as including, quote, sexual intimacy and the rights of legal fatherhood, unquote. Given the primacy of patrilineal descent, concubinage is, th is thus analytically subordinated to kin terminology and residence pattern, which is spawned multiracial families in the aristocratic households. A lesson emerges here about the multiplicity of ways uh, in which diverse people came together as a family in both in Zanzibar and in Oman. When the Zanzibari uh, Romani, Naila Al-Burwani, averred in her book, Gone is Yesterday, to know the strong kinship ties which develop in this relationship with the Romani family, Emily O'Dell issued a rejoinder in her quote, yesterday is not gone, discrediting Al-Burwani's account of blood ties with former concubines. In the spirit of black feminist thought, I reiterate the value of Al-Burwani's interpretation, which recognizes the importance of understanding context in which concubines lived and experienced their own life works. I return now to Emily Ruta. Emily Ruta was an uh, Arabian princess, uh, the daughter of Sayyid Sultan al Busaidi. Uh, she converted to Christianity and married a German merchant, took his last name and her new name, Emily Ruta. So in her memoir offers further evidence of how concubinage, when read as a text against a particular aristocratic encounter with female slaves, offers a full-blooded perspective on the kinship politics and the responsibilities and entitlements at play in a particular sec uh, at play in a particular setting. I consider it a form of ethnography, an indigenous voice, archive, an entry into a space whose prevailing power structures no outsider have had ever known better than she. So I, I will try to uh, skip a little bit. 
Professor Ali, if you can tell me how I'm doing with my time. I can't hear you. Professor Bashar, if you're doing very well, take your time. Okay, We're great. Following very intently. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Let's uh, look at the place where Sayyida Salma al Busaidi, Emily Ruta, uh, she grew up in Beit in Mithuni Palace, the locus of her narrative. It was a home, uh, it was home to a large number of female bodies available to satisfy the Sultan's desires. The light, uh, uh, Professor Abushrab, the light uh, is a little bit dim. It used to be. Uh, okay, so maybe I should, yeah, because it started to get, let me, let me move. We were okay. very sorry to, to wake you up. So at 5 a.m. in Doha, Qatar now. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, I will try to. Okay. I will move to another location. Okay. There we can't see you right now. Is that better? Or yeah, still... the light is still very dim. Be behind you, the light is better. We can see the picture. Oh, yeah, much better now. Good. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. Uh, Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No, no, it's all right. Uh, so uh, back to uh, Beth Muthoni. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we said that uh, it was home to a large number of female bodies available to satisfy the sultan's desires. Mm -hmm. This two do folks account may be compared fav favorably to the work of Rebecca Horowitz, uh, who recorded the life story of Christina Sibia, the, fair, the first of 65 wives of the uncrowned Zulu king, uh, Solomon Kadizulu. Both works enhance our knowledge of the trials of marriage, sexuality, and experiences of domination enmeshed in the call of the flesh. Despite its occasionally pejorative tone, memoir is the best source we have to date for peering into the complicated words of Surrias. The palace comes into, uh, into view as a cosmopolitan space whose residents hailed from diverse regions of the world, including Zanzibar, Ethiopia, Central Asia, Madagascar, uh, Central and Eastern Africa, the Horn of Africa, Turkey, the islands of the Indian Ocean, Oman, and Persia. And where one hears, she says, Ruta, a babble of Persian, Turkish, Swahili, Circassian, Abyssinian, Nubian, to say nothing of dialects. Reflecting upon her own memory, heritage, and identity in a home from which she looked at age 20 to 22, she recalls, so far as I can remember, my father, the Sayyid or Sultan, had one principal wife from the time I was born. The other secondary wives, numbering 75 at his death, he had bought from time to time. His principal wife, Azza bin Seif, of the royal house of Oman, held absolute sway in his home. Toward the Sultan's other wives and to his children, she behaved with domineering haughtiness. Uh, luckily, she had no children of her own, else their tyranny would certainly have been unendurable. Every one of my father's children, there were 36 when he had died, was by a secondary wife, by Surya so that we were all equals and no question as to the color of our blood needed to be raised. For, from Ruta's portrayal of her father's palace politics, we learned that the Sultan's sexual exploits exceeded pleasure. As his recognition of paternity of all his sons conferred innumerable rights to power upon them. 
The fact is important for apprehending the tensions of empire. This is uh, an installer tensions of empire. Fearful of the imminent political turmoil over succession to the royal throne, the Sultan decided to acquire as many concubines in addition to legal wives as a preemptive measure against brothers consp conspiring against each other. Full brothers, for example, against half brothers. All the sons, therefore, were half brothers, thus making their plots against others nearly impossible. Michael Fields' genealogical charts of Al Buzaidi dynasty in Zanzibar further contextualize, contextualizes my understanding of Sayyid Saidi's strategic approach. Not only was the paternity of his son from Ethiopian Surreas recognized, but in the fullness of time, they rose to the throne, including Sultan uh, Suweni, Turkey, and Barqash. Uh, the most famous of all of the uh, half Ethiopian Omani sultans. Here again, Ingold's correspondence thinking helps us understand how politics and pedigree converged in the sultan's mind. I go a little bit to Abdel Wahab of Deba, Sexuality in Islam. Uh, in which he illuminates further the relationship lying at the source of the correspondence. Quoting the authoritative uh, Islamic text and Mukhtasar, he writes, when a slave gives her master a child, she becomes for him a concubine mother, um walad. Uh, he may neither sell her nor transfer her uh, to the ownership of another. But, the may, uh, but he may have sex with her, require that she serve him, praise her services to others, and marry her. In Zanzibar, most of the men who had sexual relations with concubines acknowledged paternity and economic responsibility towards resulting children, an acknowledgement that fortified the woman's place as a right-bearing individual. Correspondence in this circumstance helps uh, see uh, the complex emotions that ensnared wives and secondary wives wrestling with ambivalence and uncertainty over the longevity of their relations with the man involved. Two thoughts conclude my uh, just previous discussion. First, the term surya not, and not concubine in the context of kinship does not apply to women who were also second, uh, were, yeah, not concubine. It is Surya, not concubine, is a term. And second, the strong kinship politics present in this situation was further consolidated by the fact that the Surya was subject to the incest taboo. According uh, to a hub in Sharia law, if a Surya was owned by the father of the house, then his brothers or son, sons had absolutely no sexual rights toward her. Uh, it follows from this identity as secondary wife that upon the death of the man, legal co-wives were obliged to observe re the religiously sanctioned widow's right, mourning right of interment for four months and 10 days. So in this moral economy, this rule applied to the, the two categories of wife and secondary wife surreas, both of them. Uh, so there you have the incest taboo and you have the conundrum of the internment and habis. Uh, so let's talk about jealousies. And I am experimenting with this and I really hope you can uh, criticize, you can comment on this and you can set me straight Jealous rage. In Ruta's account, the royal household was riven with, a, with perver a pervasive jealousy, jealousy, an atmosphere that took an emotional toll on wives and surreas alike. We can appreciate this affect when we consider Bohdeba's discussion of the two images of the royal surreya. Intruder, there is an image of the intruder, and also there are the image of the anti-wife. He writes, 
One should point out that the presence in a single household of beautiful female slaves must have created scenes of jealousy between co-wives who were already often forced to share the same favors of the master among themselves and who saw themselves outwitted by concubines. The concubine was the intruder par excellence. Okay, okay, and end of quote. This sense of intrusion, already omnipresent, was only heightened by the arrival of new women and further yet by the specter of pregnancy, uh, which promised important transformations in the Surya's class identity. Ruta's depictions conjure up an image in which all the women in the royal household were jealous and resentful of each other. Underlying all was a recognition of the loss that could result in unpredictable relationship with the man. On that both legal, one that both legal wife and Surya were vying to balance on a, on a knife's edge. Their anxiety as knowing subjects over imminent harm may be interpreted or corresponding on corresponding access of sex, mobility, kinship, and maybe love collectively complicating the boundaries of the carnal and the political. Anthropologists' insights into emotions help us appreciate jealousy as a manifestation of the fear of loss that loomed over a woman's future, whether wife or anti-wife. Drawing from parrots the definition of jealousy as an emotion experienced when a person is threat threatened by loss of an important relationship with another person, the partner, to arrival, linguist Anna Wiersbeke explains that jealousy is an emotion universally entangled with the restricted to, to triangle interpersonal relationships. So when I juxtapose this with the fact that men never set eyes, uh, here I'm talking about Omani men, on wives selected by their families before their wedding night, their choice of the veritable anti-wives can be seen as a rebellion against their own family. And uh, so I will, I will uh, go to Bahleba to say that um, he, he, he talked, he just differentiated, I would just summarize here. He differentiated the austerity of knowledge of the wife as opposed to the visibility to the visibility and the interaction that develops between uh, the man and the Surya. And, in, and the fact that the Surya came to be really very highly valued, her femininity was smashing and everything that he talked about here, talked to a kind of, um, he called it, he said, we can't actually rule out love. The same thing happened with uh, imperial harem in the Ottoman dynasty when Pierce said we found, uh, you know, that dynamic at where. Okay, so, but I have to uh, think about it without coming across as defending uh, the aristocratic men who just took concubines because they are resentful of their wives. They never, they didn't know them. They never met them before their marriage, no interaction, totally strangers. But with the Surya, the, there is that uh, long relationship that develops over time through service, chatting and so on. Uh, so let me uh, just go back, uh, I'm, I'm skipping so that we can go to the marriage. So uh, when, when Ruta tells us about jealousies that gripped all the pa palace residents in the face of diminished attention from the master and hence chances of impregnation, we are drawn closer to understanding the marked indeterminacy etched in these relationships. We also come to know the materiality of the boundaries that the new generation of Surias appear to transgress in the minds of their predecessors. These existential worries and the nightmares over diminished or even ruined encounters with the Sultan were rendered simply 
unendurable. The granularity uh, of these human emotions residing at the fault lines of politics and pedigree was far from natural or an essence to be distilled, as Lut Lutz, Kathleen Lutz cogently argues in her formidable and natural emotions. If in this case, concubinage, women were eager to amass dividends from kin affinity and ascendancy to power through the womb, then uh, Burkhard Schnepel is correct to draw our attention to the dialectics of power and suffering in history and space. In spite of the complex picture that emerges from these varied accounts, one cannot agree with rationalizations about Indian Ocean slavery as a more benign institution than its Atlantic counterpart. I just want to make that clear because in that field, there is always comparisons. Uh, but not with the, withstanding significant and vast cultural, economic and political differences in a slave holding context, the very fact that unfettered political, politically constructed desires, libid libidinal derives and access to women's bodies unequivocally contest claims to benign slavery. This argument obtains in the narration of Nadua Zakarumi to follow, where acts of domination and subjugation of teenage girls were meted out with militant impunity. Nowhere was this violence more evident than in the case of Foja young girls who were reported uh, by the Zanzibari diaspora in London, and their case was featured in, New York, the, in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. So let me go to what I call gunpoint matrimonies. In their important anthology, Marriage by Force, Contestation over Consent and Coercion in Africa, the editors, Annie Bunting, Benjamin Lawrence, and Richard Roberts, touch on the core requisite of marriage that is consent. Read in this slide, Nadua was predicated upon brute force, visited upon young uh, women that manifested a sexual politics aimed at controlling women's reproductive labor. In the minds of its pro proponents, however, Nadua was a bona fide nation building project sanctioned by a, pre a presidential decree, even though it entailed forcing women to marry without consent and at gunpoint to intimidate them and their parents to accept the proposed marriages, deploying the magisterial authority of a head of state, Abid Amani Karomi, passed Nudua, some people called it the Marriage Solmonization Act of uh, 1966. It treats no person is allowed to withhold his consent to any in intended marriage for any reason other than those mentioned in the act. The only reason for withholding consent mentioned by this legislation is if a man has been convicted of theft and is currently suffering from venereal diseases, tubercul tuberculosis or leprosy, or is suffering from mental illness. The law also provided punishment for any person who acts in contravention of this section. If found guilty, shall be, shall be liable to imprisonment for a term exceeding six years or a fine of 15,000 shillings, Tanzanian shillings or both. Okay, uh, and also the last thing is infliction of corporal punishment and uh, flogging. The law was followed to a letter by some members of Karumi's Revolutionary Council who married uh, young women against their wishes. The manner in which Nadua was pursued obscured the stated revolutionary goals of bringing about racial equality and heightened the angry emotional climate within which its very premise was hatched. Nonetheless, men who rose to the highest echelons of military power welcomed the duo with gusto, as had others who believed in Karumi's intents. 
it was neither seen as rape nor sexual assault of anat 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 anatomically anatomically <laughs> unprepared girls. Not the accommodating Swahili statement articulated with conviction in this very real theater of the absurd. The combination of the blood relatives of the Zanzibar tribes, which is now visible, is a call and wisdom by Mizi. Mizi means Elder Karomi. The aim is to improve stratification, to remove stratification within Zanzibari society. All we can say is that. Mizi Karumi succeeded. Uh, there are a lot of statements like that translated from Swahili, but I will skip and just go to uh, the fact that how he did this uh, instead of uh, the legislation was not just there uh, doubled down by uh, giving you know talks and holding rallies. One was very important uh, that was many, uh, you know, mentioned to be by interlocutors in Tanzania uh, of a public rally that he held in Victoria Garden. And he actually told people, it, just go and ask for anybody that you want to get married. And if they say no, the whole family will go to jail and will be beaten. Uh, so there is uh, something that was very uh, important uh, and, and contrary to the approving comments uh, were the voices of Zanzibaris uh, who objected in the strongest possible terms. And here I'm talking about Zanzibaris, both of Arab and African descent. Critics have emphasized that forced marriage violates, uh, violates teenage uh, brides' right to consent to their bodily integrity and to the right of the child, as it has other women in African societies who had endured marriage by force. To cite only one example, uh, Mrs. N.J., an interlocutor in Mbuja, strenuously objected to those who viewed Nadua as a national project aimed at equality and justice. She described the ways in which these young kids had responded to the decree. She said the girls who were forced to marry the old military leaders, uh, they had no, option, had no option but to succumb to these men who had no sympathy towards the young kids. Some of these teenagers went crazy. Others abandoned their babies and fled. Their lives were ruined. No one back then understood that you can't force love. And this is just interesting. Uh, other, uh, others provided more contextualized perspectives. For example, most uh, Zanzibari Omanis with whom I spoke about forced marriage invariably prefaced their insights with two comments. Ferris, they reminded me of their Swahili African subjectivity, an identity they hold in high esteem and with justifiable solemnity. And second, they stated that Arab and African communities in Zanzibar have intermarried for centuries, uh, hadn't it been for the British involvement of divide and rule. Uh, they objected to the reluctance to acknowledge these facts in the representations of Omani experiences in East Africa. Among the fairest uh, people I spoke to was Muhammad Ali Mohsen al-Barwani, whose father was the fairest elected person in Mohsen al-Barwani in Zanzibar of the National Ummah Party. And he talked about that, I will skip, but he talked about the racialized politics that uh, the British uh, put in place for 60 years. And here we have to remember that the uh, Omani Sultan had no power over the subjects, none whatsoever, because Zanzibar was a British protectorate from 1890 to 1963. So um, let me see. Then we need to wrap up so that we can have uh, yes. questions answered. Yeah. So somebody was saying, um, Okay, uh, I don't see the problem as, okay, why people um, 
degrade Africans and refuse uh, to allow their, their daughters. Uh, they said it is not, it is not a, a matter of takafu from a racial perspective. So um, I, I am skipping, I'm skipping. So, but I want to point out that in so much of the representational discussion about uh, marriage, the Forced Marriage Act, in, in Euro-American uh, imagination, a lot of uh, discussion about, okay, this is considered marrying beneath herself in uh, a piece by Elizabeth McMahon, who uh, just looked at that from the standpoint of what she calls kafa'a. Uh, and the first thing is, there is uh, also a mistranslation because it is takafo, right? Equivalence. Right. So she, uh, uh, so I, to point a wrong headed concept to begin with. In, in their rend rendering, another critical consequence of this misinterpretation uh, and mistranslation is the failure to uh, understand that takafo applied across racial class uh, uh, religious lines. For example, somebody said that uh, if a poor person who happened to be of Arab descent or, or a very rich aristocratic man who have to have some uh, idiosyncratic uh, you know, awful traits, still the rule of the kafo applies, even if he wanted to marry a, another Arab woman or so he is not he is not equipped. And uh, again, the kafo is something that was enjoined by uh, Prophet Muhammad and uh, to to try to preempt jealousies to uh, you know, conjugal conflicts over, you know, differences. Okay, I will try to uh, wrap up. So um, the, <clears throat> I will summarize that the, the marriage, the forced marriages continued. Uh, people continue to be imprisoned. And at some point you get really fatigued by the kind of power imposed on you to agree. So some people, you know, sort of submitted uh, begrudgingly. And, uh, but what happened uh, for a new nation as Zanzibar, as uh, you know, uh, and Tanzania, because now we have to understand it became part of the union and Nairere himself tried to convince Karumi to uh, abandon that law to no avail. So Triplet tells us that the Zanzibar government re refused to relent, claiming that such marriages were the only way to, end, to ensure racial equality and harmony. So uh, a woman who remembers the predicament of forced bride couldn't help but to mutter uh, sadly, Natamani Kufua Makaburi. That means I am tempted to dig up the graves. She was so mad. Uh, another added the leadership, the military leadership forgot the mission and purpose of the revolution is strengthening the unity of Zanzibaris. Okay, I am uh, approaching my conclusion. Okay. So I will try to rush to it. The conclusion is basically with a subheading raw power. From the above uh, presentation, and what the above presentation reveals are practices, obviously, of asymmetrical power. In both concubinage and forced marriage, the naughtiest ideological conundrums reside in the desire to control uh, women's reproduction, a control bound to kinship. While Ruta tells us that the woman <coughs> of the palace were driven by jealousies, any efforts by forced brides to resist were in vain, given the same structures of patriarchal power, because they also wanted to get pregnant. Sexual politics, in other words, 
clearly animated the interactions between the powerful Zanzibari men and women within the context of patrilineal social arrangements of kinship. As Milosov has written, kinship institutions are the culprit for it was through their development that the subjugation of women was achieved. Marriage conjugally and paternal filiation all were imposed upon women by men to be the means through which men could constrain women, unquote. Political interest aside, the sexual objectification of Zanzibari women translated desire and lust into immeasurable social suffering, all the while fogging matters of pleasure and displeasure. In both scenarios, the fact that sex took place between powerful men and subordinated women and young, young girls bespeaks the limits of agency and unfettered con consent, of course, is impossible to grant in such circumstances. Beyond rationalizations of upward social mobility or the erasure of racial hierarchies depriving a woman the right to choose whether or not to enter a conjugal relation with a man is an exist existential negation of her as an individuated self. The institutions of concubinage or sarari and forced marriage therefore highlight the intricacies of sex and power before and after the 1964 revolution. What we learn from Pierre Bourdieu analysis of the interlacing of the ideological and the practical is that it ensures the reproduction of the relations uh, of domination. And quote, through an intertextual reading of these practices coupled with my preliminary ethnographic commentary, this presentation hope to demonstrate that human convergences and correspondences happen in myriad ways unamenable to reductive logic. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Abushara, for this fascinating presentation, despite the pain. Um, <laughs> <laughs> of um, you know what these women went through and uh, uh, some of them still going through and um, you know as you continued speaking I couldn't you know help but remember my earlier studies on African American literature especially such books as um, um, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl by, by uh, Harry Jacobs and the uh, Frederick Douglass' live narrative and, and Alex Haley's Queen. And, and, and so how could you compare that? I mean, you already touched upon that and the slave, you know, the, uh, um, the, uh, the slave narrative of those, you know, even, even Tony Morrison's beloved and the reflections of the neo, you know, slavery. And so, um, and, and so the, especially Harriet Jacobs, Incidents in the life of a slave girl, mm -hmm. and you know, which is considered like you know uh, the genre of new historicism, you know, yeah. the, the history, and yes. uh, and and the fact that and even Frederick Douglass's slave narrative and and his uh, relating that the offspring of a slave, um, you know, uh, would be a slave owner would be part of his property. And this is exactly the same thing we are talking about in, in yeah. Zanzibari and you know um, uh, concubinage and 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 then and, 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 uh, and uh, forced marriage and uh, so so reflect if you would please with this kind of comparative you know approach. Yeah. You know you are absolutely right. Uh, when I was talking about the the difficulty of not knowing enough about stories of concubines written by themselves. Yes. Like that, you know, the, the story of Linda Brent, yeah, exactly. Harriet Jacob, yeah. uh, continued to come to mind when with her rape, uh, abuse and everything and the separation of the families and so on. That clearly didn't happen in Zanzibar. Yeah. And one of the uh, very important things that I've, you know, the fact that the issue of the elevation of queen mother, I have seen it when I visited uh, one of the palaces, one of the important palaces in Unguja, and uh, in the palace yard, which is, you know, is 
you hear the palace, but these are all now relative terms. <laughs> it wasn't that much big of a palace. Uh, but the one, uh, th this is Sultan Harub, mm -hmm. who um, had a surya, married her, and her name was Ma'atuqa, manumitted. Yes. So Queen <laughs> Ma'atuqa was buried next to him because that was, you know, in his will because he depended she was a de facto ruler you know uh, and she was of african descent yes and, and just just to explain to those who don't speak arabic the reflection of matuka as the freed one very, yes you know yes. very uh, uh, sarcastically yes so uh, she um, became queen mother you know, yeah. uh, and uh, she was a de facto ruler during Al Busaidi. And uh, yeah, Ma'atuqa comes from Atq or manumission. Mm -hmm. And um, there are different places in Zanzibar, including a girls' school named after her and so on. There is something else that uh, I noticed in the scholarship about architecture of old Omani houses in Zanzibar. And they talked about how the slave women were kept, you know, in their own quarters. And, but there was something that is very interesting. And here, a Christian uh, tour guide, you know, from Tanzania was saying, uh, very, very knowledgeable man. He was saying that actually all the women, Surias or not, we're here, they have a whole wing to themselves. So that made sense. So, so they were living in the same palace with the Sultan. They didn't have a slave quarters. But upon, yeah, when you read, you compare and contrast, there is nothing uh, about selling, why, uh, selling surias and their children on auction blocks with donkeys and horses. Uh, there was, again, the acknowledgement of the paternity, the issue of inheritance in the wills. There is, uh, in elsewhere, uh, a group of people, Saadi Abdel Wahab is one of them, uh, talked about how the Sultan usually prepares a will, the best of you who die, you know, leaving uh, behind yeah. a will, uh, in which he he actually leaves quite a bit for the concubine. I, I know that this is, this is a, a huge difference. Right. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Heidi, uh, do you have a question? Any, uh, I'd, like, uh, I'd like to open it up for, for uh, questions from any in the audience. Heidi, uh, did, you, did you have your hand up? Uh, no. Oh, thank you. So um, I, now at this point, I'd like to open it up for any comments, any questions, anybody who would like to? Yes. Yeah. Um, Professor Busharaf, I have here with me Professor Jalab, and the Asma Sautak Wala can ask you a question from a distance. Go ahead. Uh, hello. hello, Professor Jalab. Nice uh, to hear your voice. <laughs> اهلا بك يا رقية اهلا بك الله يبارك فيك I really enjoyed your presentation actually I visited Zanzibar twice yeah. I visited Pimpa and mm. uh, I've been uh, for some time I've been working on a project about the Indian Ocean slave trade Oh. And uh, of course, these islands, most of these islands, Zanzibar is the biggest. Uh, uh, there is some kind of uh, uh, a very importance for that to us, the Sudanese, because some of those people, they claim uh, that either they are Arabs or Shirazi. So, so mm. that's a very important and complex uh, a part of the world. My question, uh, what is your take on what uh, both Kromi has done? Uh, was it genocide 
or revolution because some people they consider it as a, uh, as a genocide and others they they consider that as a uh, the as a revolution and also i would refer you to abdullah ibrahim i think he wrote an yes. article about, yeah about that yeah in a book that i co-edited with dale eichelman he mm. wrote about that and he wrote about the genocide yeah. i I tend to um, look at the bigger context and the international political um, environment at play at that point. The revolution did not start, it was not homegrown. It wasn't a homegrown. No. If, uh, as I said, it started with John Okello, who was a Ugandan, and who was, um, he had connections in, in, on the island. He didn't have a lot of success in Pemba when he tried to say, let's kill yeah. all of these Arabs. And the Africans in Pemba, they said, there is no way. This, you know, mm. our neighbors and our families, and we are living peacefully. Mm. Uh, and here we are talking about the class of farmers, because of course, not all Oman is, uh, came from al Busaidi dynasty. Yeah. But uh, I think I think what happened, if, if we look at the genocide convention uh, that and, and the intentionality of destroying an ethnic group, yeah. whether it was a pragmatic, through pragmatic or actual ethnic cleansing in the context of the killings, because people were identified, mm -hmm. okay, earmarked for extinction, I would say that it was genocide. Yeah. Uh, if, but that, the, the actions, the actions, did the Africans, okay, the majority Africans, did they have the right to rise? I would say that if, if there was that kind of sentiment that was homegrown, revolutionary, forever, we are talking about something totally different because this would be also about their political, social, and economic rights. These are justifiable rights. Uh, the, the thing is, if you notice, um, when we talk about the revolution took only nine hours, mm. that is because Zanzibar at that time, they didn't, didn't, didn't have an army. Yeah. So what happened is that the, the communications with Julius Nairere, Nairere, of course, in Tanganyika had full-blown army. So you have the consolidation of that. And uh, at that point, uh, he was trying, this was Nairere, trying yeah. to say, let's unionize, let's be part of, uh, you know, be part of this, the international politics of the fear of Zanzibar being an African Cuba, okay? Because, you know, Babu and the others initially espoused yeah. uh, a Marxist uh, approach, you know, but it didn't happen, but at the same time, that was something that was put forward. So I think it is both. As, as paradoxical as this may sound, I think it is both. I think I recognize that both parties, because Zanzibar is such a complicated place as you yeah. mentioned correctly, Professor Jallab, yeah. um, the issues of basic social justice issues, uh, the fact that people lived peacefully, yes, that was a reality on the island, yeah. but that does not mean people should just settle uh, and stop worrying about economic mobility, upward mobility. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed. And you Thank know, you. at this point, I'd like to 
Thank you, Professor Abushara, for this fascinating presentation and to thank all of our you know, members of the audience, faculty and students. And uh, I'd like to uh, um, you know, apologize to you again you know, no, wake no. Up so so early uh, in Doha, Qatar, and uh, I'd like to remind our audience and all of you that uh, our next um, lecture would be on October uh, October seventeenth, the Humanities Week, with Professor uh, Tahira Qutbuddin from the University of Chicago. And uh, you know, as you just remind everybody uh, again that you know the lecture series, you know, of the Council of Arabic Science Studies. Um, you, you know, brings um, distinguished uh, professors and scholars uh, to share their research, you know, in Islamic studies and African studies and uh, Middle Eastern studies uh, to the ASU community uh, for faculty and, and uh, students and the community at large. So at this point, I'd like to thank you again. Thank you very much indeed. We really appreciated your presentation and we- Thank you. We, we hope to have you again sometime. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was such an honor to accept an, an invitation coming from you. How could I not wake up Thank at five? <laughs> at four? You know, Hopefully so, next time we're going to have you in person coming to ASU. Uh, uh, I would be most honored and delighted. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for uh, your question. And I hope that you and I can talk some more. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I'd like to, okay. I know that it's getting a bit late here because it's now after eight and uh, for the students to begin preparing for their, you know, classes tomorrow. But, um, yes. you know, I have so many- To be other... continued, to be yeah, continued. Especially- and Professor Gellab, thank you so much for your question. Yeah, I would like to have a telephone call with you and talk about these issues. Uh, sure, uh, sure. Because we as Sudanese, I think we need to look carefully into what, what happened in, in those areas and how that reflected uh, on our, uh, our uh, identity and livelihood and... Uh... Sure. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay. The, conversation, the conversation will continue. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Take good Thank care. Take good you care. Thank you care. again so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.